Whether we are there or not, ITSP Magazine still gets the best stories. Plenty of conferences and events spark our curiosity and allow us to start conversations with some of the world's brightest minds. In person or virtually, Sean Martin and Marco Cipelli go on location and sit down with them at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Together, we discover what the synergy of these three elements means for the future of humanity. Marco. Sean, where are we going? We're going to San Francisco. Ah, good. Because you said, I'll pick you up. And uh, and I have said yes, but I, I know. didn't know where I we think, were going. I think I let you know at the last minute you're on this I ride know, with me today. I know. I'm always happy to go to San Francisco, though. So okay. what, what's going on there? Well, it's uh, a lot of things, uh, but it's a conference hosted by OWASP. It's a global conference held in San Francisco. So as you know, I was in, in uh, Lisbon with the crew there and had some really great chats. And I said, you know what? I want to I want to do more with AppSec. So it's a focus for me, uh, late, certainly through the rest of this year and probably in, into next year as well. Apps are a big part of everything we do in, in business and in life in general. And there's a lot of a lot of sessions and topics talking about how do we secure apps? How do we secure the data in them? How do we secure the transactions? How do we maintain privacy? Uh, how does AI impact all this stuff? And, and ultimately it all starts with what's in the software, <laughs> at least from my perspective, and how secure are each of the, each of the See, components. That's the difference between me and you. You want to know what is in the software. I want to know what happened after it. You want to know? <laughs> what, what I like to know what's society. in the recipe and hopefully it tastes good. You just want to know does, <laughs> does it taste that's good. True. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, well let's, let's, let's introduce our guest here. I know. I'm thrilled. Cassie Crossley's been on the show uh, a couple of times now. She's written a book. We've had her on for the book. We, we had a chat uh, in Broadcast Alley at RSA Conference. Uh, it's a pleasure, Cassie, to have you on again. Great. Thank you so much for having me here, Sean and Marco. Yeah, super fun. And this is part of, yeah, if folks haven't figured out, this is part of our Chats on the Road uh, to OWASP Global in San Francisco. Uh, we're going to have a few chats from folks speaking there, a couple of keynotes and uh, an update on the OWASP Top 10 for AI LLMs and, and uh, a bunch of stuff. So, But today we're looking at software, bill of materials, S-bombs, not bombs with a B at the end, but a bomb <laughs> with a B at the front. Um, always... AI happens to uh, have fun with that when it when it trans transcribes things. But anyway, Cassie, um, congratulations on getting a speaking spot in San Francisco. Um, can you give us maybe an overview of for folks who aren't familiar with bill of materials for in the software world? Um, it's not unlike what you find on a label for food, perhaps, but. Uh, a little more complicated, I don't know, maybe easier, and we just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> so kind of give us an overview of what built SBOMs are, bill of materials, and uh, how that's impacting how we operate and work and at home. Sure, sure. Well, I think that uh, software bills of materials, uh, they are something that as developers, we've had for a long time, we kept track of what open source we were using, what licensing we were using. Uh, but in general, we never provided that to external resources. If you look at, for example, the Instagram about page, it actually lists the open source that they use uh, within the product. And that is something that those that are running applications would like to know more about. And we saw this primarily uh, come to the forefront with Log4j. People wanted to know, am I affected really quickly? And they, they would have scanners that could detect it. But for a lot of products, such as software products or even um, firmware, we have uh, at Schneider Electric, we've got 15,000 plus uh, intelligent products. A lot of them are firmware. Uh, which embedded software. And then of course uh, we have mobile apps and cloud and on-premise software. So all of the various mixtures, but being able to, if you're at a company and you don't have scanning tools that can look to see if you're at least even using that library open source, let alone there are commercial libraries, you know, closed source libraries that you wouldn't know. And so the software bill of materials provides that list 
Uh, it can be what's called just the, you know, the tier one, the first party list, uh, third party list of just what I'm using, but software libraries can call other software libraries. So there's something called transitive dependencies, and that means I'm dependent on something. And so software bills of material are much more complicated. So for example, if you're looking at a recipe list and it has a recipe, uh, an ingredient that has one component, but that component can be made up of other components, sometimes that information is not detailed out even on those ingredients. And so software bills of material are you going to just have a list like a PDF? But there's really two main machine readable formats called Cyclone DX and SPDX. So I'm going to be talking about how our company leverages those um, at the OWASP AppSec event. It's kind of like how how far back do you go? Right? It's kind of like okay, well, to, to go at the Big Bang, we're all made of same um, the same stuff of the universe. But do we really need to? know that to cure something <laughs> or to you know so what where, where, what do you think is enough to to go back and have this list of related development sure well i think the more you know the better informed you can potentially be uh so for example um let's just take it wasn't a cyber event but let's just take the crowd strike and for those uh that were having their systems go down um, they were working with these third-party systems that they probably did not create, and they were using CrowdStrike on those systems. So what kind of transparency did you, if you are buying a baggage handling system and they're using CrowdStrike, because you asked them to keep it secure, and so they did, but they just didn't, you know, in that case, you don't know what those additional dependencies. So I think it's important for us to understand both our third party, but also fourth party and above. The you know, you're not just your tier one suppliers, but potentially your tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers, because we're very interconnected um, in the world. And that's what the software bill of materials like at the moment. I don't have an SBOM for the dot Microsoft.net DLLs or the Oracle Java. So they could be using open source and I don't know that it's compiled binary. So, you know, where are we going to, you know, go further for that transparency? I think it's important uh, for that visibility and to better manage risk. So your session is called, called uh, or entitled uh, the missing link, how we collect and leverage SBOMs. So I want to hone in on the, the .NET just as one example. So in that world where we have no idea, right, what's inside, maybe some idea, but not completely, mm -hmm. um, how do organizations kind of factor that in? To me, that's many missing links underneath. Yes. So do we just, do we identify that, assign some risk level? Is there a standard risk level that we can assign, or is it based on individual organizations, risk appetite, and and then what do we do? Do we put additional controls or other mitigating factors in the development process, the deployment process, the operating process, the operating environment? <laughs> what does that look like? Yeah, man, that's a lot of questions that you just put in there, Sean. Um, you so have let's 20 look, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> let's look at it from uh, the world of a product developer. Uh, having that visibility when you're making that decision, whether or not, so let's just say you're starting new of using some open source and it may have some additional open source it calls. That's really important uh, decisions that we need to take now that before it's like, oh, it works. But now you have so many supply chain attacks. I mean, just for, you know, the revival, you know, hack and things like that, where people are replacing old PyPy libraries that were deleted with new libraries. So all of this, there's risk that you're bringing in. I like to say developers are essentially, you know, a doctor with a scalpel without any training at this point. Um, there is a lot that they can do, but a lot of damage that can be caused and without having better uh, information to make those risk-based decisions, uh, you might make you know, a wrong choice. So in the world of uh, software bill materials, so let's say I was going to buy a library from somebody to include in a product. And I asked them for, you know, if it's compiled, but if I've seen the source course code and I have that, I can have some visibility and I can do my own research. There's not a one way fits all open SS 
OpenSSF has a scorecard, but there are ways to get around better scoring of open source. You know, any any brand new open source that is released, I would be very hesitant um, without doing a lot of risk evaluation, scanning, reviewing of the code if it's less than one year old and not being leveraged in other places. And that's one of the benefits of an SBOM let's in, in our world, I can see with my large uh, product base with the SBOMs collected, I can see which open source we're leveraging quite a bit. So I can identify and uh, watch for you know key areas. We've seen it a lot with OpenSSL, right? I mean, there's just been numerous vulnerabilities that have been released over the years and having that library of which products are using OpenSSL is very valuable. And that's sort of that missing link is before very being dependent on that product team, we're also as a risk and governance uh, group able to look at, you know, where, which product set, you know, is this risk? We see this with commercial products too. There are some commercial products that are more geared toward, let's say, real-time operating systems or using embedded Linux. So knowing which product sets are using that gives us a quick uh, idea, even Codasys. Uh, which is a commercial library, it can be used in certain types of products. So we're able to leverage and understand deeper without going to, we've got hundreds and hundreds of product teams and going to them every single time about a, you know something or a question when I have that information that's available in software bills and materials is is really being able to reduce, they can focus on what they're working on. And when it looks like something, we do need to ask for more detail of whether or not they are affected. Because just because you have a library doesn't mean that you're affected. Because there could be mitigation, mitigating controls, like you mentioned. There could be uh, what we call backporting patches. So if I have version seven, but version eight had a patch for a security fix, I could potentially bring that a patch into version seven, I could have branched that software and removed a lot of the extra code that I didn't need. So there are many reasons why just because you have that label of that library could mean you're not affected by a certain vulnerability. And again, we saw that in the log for shell log for J where you know, there was actually two CVEs and, you know, if you stand on your, you know, one leg and tap your head and rub your belly, you might have been affected, but, you know, the other side you weren't. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a validation that dev teams in general still have to do. So one question for me, like you work for Schneider's as a big corporation and I can see resources that that are available, a team to, to go and dig deep into these and patch. And I'm thinking like the smaller company, they may just rely on this list, which I think is necessary, but is there a, I don't know, a tier one and a tier two of how in depth you can go, maybe a third party assessment solution that could help protect and provide this to those that don't have the huge resources that you may have? Sure, I work with startups, you know, all the time, both as suppliers, but but customers too. Uh, from a software bill materials, let me just say, uh, this is something that any dev team can implement. And those with a more modern pipeline, more modern CI CD process and build pipeline, they can easily find projects or something that can tie in and create the software bill material so that they can provide it to their customers. So overall, uh, they have, uh, let's say, a better advantage than those that have had build cycles that might be, you know, a decade or more mm -hmm. old, like mm -hmm. in my world. But in the consumption and the risk factor, so let's take a look at, you know, what I like to use the example of water utilities. They're definitely underfunded from a resource and IT and OT perspective. Uh, and, you know, they're not going to go find a service to be able to leverage. So we are, um, as a critical infrastructure provider, we provide those SBOMs to customers and there are free tools or something called dependency track that they can actually import that uh, software build materials. However, it's not the easiest. There are some other uh, ways that people are going to be ingesting those, but you can just actually take the SBOM and look at an XML viewer and just do a search. 
like if I had them all, you know, all of my S bombs from a bunch of different uh, different companies, I could put them all in a folder. And the moment you know a new log for J, you know, version whatever comes out, at least I know where I might have an impact. So it's really, um, I love this uh, example that a CISO for a electrical utility gave me an example. He goes, I have to know if I need to put eyes on a dial. And what that means is he has to know, should he focus his intention, may not have the answer, but if there's a potential risk, so a lot of what I see is that uh, even just asset management, noting whether or not those assets are internet facing, internet connected, not just connectable, because you've got lots of OT products that are within the you know firewall, segmented off, or whatever. But just knowing which ones are internet affect, you know, internet facing is really important. That's where you should be prioritizing. So looking even at separating out those, if I was at a very small company, separating out the SBOMs from the internet facing applications versus the internal, I've already done a super easy risk management to say, those are the ones I need to consider patching and upgrading and finding out. And there is something called that we're working on as an industry called VEX, which is the Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. And what that would do is it would say, these two log4j CVEs, we are um, affected or not affected, or we're looking at it. You know, it's we're investigating it. And eventually, it's really hard right now. It's a you know, think of all the thousands of then objects just for log4j. I would have had about 256,000 records because of all the different SBOM versions and everything. But as a simple way to just manage this, having those SBOMs and that visibility, it's not perfect, but it will get you somewhere um, to know the risk. So, you know, I think there are definitely ways that you can manage it even at a small company level. Now, getting those S bombs from uh, large corporations is still a difficult task. It's not mandatory that they provide it. Even the FDA uh, has required S bombs now to be provided, but only to them. It's not mandatory that you provide it to the hospitals. So, you know, there's a ways to go uh, whether or not your supplier or manufacturer is willing to give you that information. So I asked you the wrong question. Should I ask <laughs> the way around? <laughs> uh, well, there, there's no wrong question and no lack of questions. Uh, that's for sure. It's a topic that uh, that's intriguing to me, and it's one that the government invests in heavily. I know CISA is doing, doing quite yes. a bit. And I was actually uh, chatting with uh, Alan Friedman this morning, uh, who, focuses on this quite a bit. I think if That's you say right. that if you say S bomb, Alan pops out of the woodwork and, yes. and yes. goes up some. But That's right. uh, yeah, I'm gonna he's at uh CISA event talking about this. I'm gonna catch up with him in a week or so and, and get get yes. an update from him as well. Yeah. But we first, have the S bomb arama uh, yes. in Denver in a, in right. uh, I'll leave it for it tomorrow afternoon. There you go. So kind of a double event coverage. So you you'll be there with Alan and, and others yes. uh, interested in this. Um but this is about OWASP, uh, Global yes. AppSec San Francisco. Your session is The Missing Link, How We Collect and Leverage S-Bombs. It's on yeah. Thursday, September 26th. Um, what can people expect? Some, some insights well, from what you do, what you actually yes. implement. Yeah, I, you know, it's, again, we're, we're large, but this is something what I'm demonstrating to everyone is how we've changed our mode. Uh, and really, I was impacted from uh, contracts that came in from utilities back in 2020. So in January of 2021, I required software bills and materials from all of my product teams and releases. And as I mentioned, this is not hard to really do if you have a more modern uh, pipeline. So I talk about how we've modified you know, our work and our flow and, and everything that's needed to be able to do that. But then I also talk about how we're leveraging it for vulnerability management, both for the 
vulnerability management that we provide to customers, but also, you know, moving toward the vulnerability management and working with our third party suppliers, being able to go to them and take their uh, details. You know, with open source, it's quite a bit harder. There's, you know, just the uh, who's in charge of the project and the committers, uh, but we do buy commercial libraries and we do, you know, commercial source code. So we're leveraging um, this overall platform that we're doing and, you know, I just, what it does is it shows that not only are we doing it internally, but also the value of bringing this together so that when a customer requests one, we have it available. Good stuff. I am, I'm excited to hear how that goes and I'm sure you'll have a, a packed room full of folks interested in this. Uh, it's a key part of what we do in terms of app development and delivery and and the broader ecosystem, right? Everybody's using apps and libraries and APIs now even for, for tons of stuff. So Global AppSec uh, 2024 in San Francisco, September 23rd through the 27th at the Hyatt Regency. Um, I love the OWASP community. They do great work and these conferences uh, are a tremendous way for bringing people together and having conversations and meeting folks like you We've put the work in to understand how we work through some of the challenges uh, yeah. that we face as a as a community. So I encourage everybody to attend and uh, definitely catch Cassie in, in her session and, and afterwards. And Marco, lots more coming. Lots more coming, a lot of planning. Uh, subscribe to the conference and event coverage called also On Location with Marco and Sean, or Sean and Marco, depending on <laughs> what the main topic <laughs> is, like but better. usually we try okay. to go together. So, although I didn't get to go to Portugal. You didn't get to go I'm to upset Louisiana. about that. You should, yeah. be. you should be. It was a great event. <laughs> yeah, great no, event. I had a lot of good chats there. We'll have other opportunity to, to travel and either cover virtually or in person. And Cassie, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me, gentlemen. And uh, safe journey to Espalmarama and to uh, Global AppSec. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. We'll uh, see you on the next one. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Sean and Marco's On Location event coverage conversations. Please take a moment to give the show a good rating and leave a comment. Remember to share this podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues. Come back for more conversations and follow Sean Martin and Marco Cipelli as they continue their journey toward redefining cybersecurity and society.